So, hello everyone. Thanks for coming. You're quite a bit, a uh, lot of people, but uh, than I expected. It's uh, very good. Um, so uh, today we're going to talk about Zookeeper. And the, the, really the goal of this talk is to show you that it's not as complicated or as hard as you may think. Um, I know that like a year ago, personally, I thought that I would probably never use it. Uh, that it was just meant to use in Kafka and, and other really big applications. Uh, and it tend to have a, um, yeah, something complicated, like it, it, has not a, um, it does not have a very good uh, reputation. I'm sure you'll agree. Um, so that's it. Yeah, uh, the goal is to show you that you can use it. Uh, maybe you should use it in one of your applications and can actually make your life uh, easier and your applications more uh, reliable. So, first off, a uh, little word about me. So I'm Alexandre Berto. I'm a developer at Clever Cloud. Uh, you can find me on Twitter. Um, so um, at Clever Cloud, what we do is a platform as a service. Uh, it's a hosting platform targeted towards developers. Uh, what it means is, as a developer, you just git push and we handle the rest. What we want to do is make developers' life easier. So you don't have to deal with servers, network infrastructure, security updates, and stuff like that. That's our job. You can sleep well, and we wake up when something goes wrong. Um, so. At, uh, at Clever Cloud, we've started using Zookeeper uh, a while ago now. Um, so first off, to get this out, uh, out of the way, I'm just going to talk about why Zookeeper and not why something else. Uh, why not another implementation of Paxos or whatever? Uh, why not uh, use it, uh, uh, roll it out ourselves uh, in applications? Uh, so why Zookeeper? It's battle-tested. Um, the same way I thought it was used only in really big applications uh, was because it is used in Kafka, uh, it is used in Pulsar, Apache Pulsar, and in other really big Apache projects, mostly like Solar and stuff like that. Um, and uh, even at Clever Cloud, we've been using it through Kafka and other products. And other products may fail. They do like all distributed systems, but Zookeeper, yeah, it works. So yeah, just for our products, uh, mostly at, at Clever Cloud. Um, one last thing, uh, Kyle Kingsbury, uh, which you may know as Afir on Twitter, uh, he does something um, called uh, Yepsen.io, uh, which is a, a company, uh, well, organization which tests distributed systems, databases, stuff like that, uh, to find um, if they really do what they're uh, uh, announcing, if or if not. And so he tested lots of distributed systems. And most of the time, there are failures. But Zookeeper, it works. And he says he takes it as a, as a personal failure, actually, uh, to not uh, achieve a, a fail in Zookeeper. But so yeah, it's a good product. So now, where do we use it at Clever Cloud? Uh, we use it for orchestration. So at Clever Cloud, we rolled out our own orchestration system. And um, uh, all the state of the orchestrator is in Zookeeper. Uh, this way, we, mm, we can have multiple orchestrators running at uh, one time. Uh, we can add. Uh, an orchestrator at any time, we can remove one at any time, one can crash, it's not an issue, the state is all there, so another one can, another one can um, continue the job. So that's why. Uh, we also use it for a more simpler uh, problem. Uh, we have a feature called log drains. That feature uh, takes uh, logs from our log pipeline and pushes it to an external service or an Elasticsearch add-on on our platform. Um, and so if we don't want, and we don't want to have logs uh, shuffled in, we need to have a single instance at any one time dealing with one log drain. Uh, so it's either we use Zookeeper or something like that, or we have only one instance uh, managing all the drains. Or static configurations, and when one instance is down, well, the service is down. So that's not good. So now, uh, the example I'm going to take today is Poke. So, POKE is a functional monitoring tool. Uh, 
Uh, you may know something like Pingdom or Status Cake. Um, what they do is they poke repeatedly uh, one URL. Uh, so you get some example uh, here. And uh, when it goes down or if there are, uh, are performance problems, uh, they can alert you. So um, uh, Pingdom and Status Cake are paid offerings, uh, which can be really, really costly. And what we needed here was to use it at OVH and Clever Cloud, where we do have lots of applications. Uh, especially OVH, is not, it's not very well known here in the UK, but there is a uh, booth here, so maybe you've heard of it now. Um, historically, OVH has, already, uh, has mostly done uh, shared hosting, uh, cheap shared hosting, so they have lots of sites. It's in the millions, so monitoring it is uh, quite a feat. So that's why we designed POC. Wow. Um, so this is a very basic architecture of POC. So we've got a list of checks in the database, a scheduler here, uh, and then it goes through Kafka, monitoring agents, which ran uh, right to Warp10, which is a time series database, which works with Kafka and HBase. So as you can see, it's pretty obvious. Everything is distributed except the scheduler. So that's what we're gonna go. Uh, that's what we're going to talk about today. Sorry. Um, so yeah, what we want is multiple schedulers to spread out the load, and to be sure that the service is actually available. Uh, monitoring tool being down is just uh, <laughs> there's no point. Uh, and so um, what we want is a dynamic number of schedulers. We want to be able to add a scheduler at any one time, lose a scheduler at any one time, without any consequence to the service. So, uh, the scheduler's job is to take the list of checks which is in the database. So a check is um, a domain, a path, and a kind of check. So I've only talked about HTTP checks, but we have DNS checks, uh, SSL checks, and uh, ICMP classic ping checks. So it takes that list of checks, and it schedules it out on a Kafka topic, which is read by the monitoring agents. So it's a quite a simple job, but when you have millions and millions of checks, uh, running it on a single instance is problematic. So what we'll be doing is uh, what's called sharding. So sharding is splitting out a problem, a piece of data, into multiple chunks, which can be called shards or chunks, whichever you prefer. Um, so we've got our checks spread out in uh, six shards, completely arbitrary, sorry. And what we're going to do is affect them to specific schedulers. Sorry. So, before we go on, I have to sum theory just a bit show what we need in Zookeeper, what, we, what we'll be using. So Zookeeper, basically, it's a database. It's not something fancy. Uh, well, it is a bit fancy, but at its core, it's a database. A little bit special. Um, so it behaves as a tree, uh, and it's shown as a file system uh, structure. So you have a bunch of nodes. Each node can have children and can have data. So it's a bit like a file system, except a directory can hold data as well as children. And a specific thing, which I'm going to use here because it's used everywhere in the Zookeeper uh, documentation and, uh, and ecosystem, um, they call one element of the tree a Z node uh, instead of a node. Um, they do that to avoid the confusion with the node being a server in the Zookeeper cluster. So a Z node is an element of the data, and a node is a Zookeeper server. So now let's dive into the example. Um, so it's going to be done in two parts. First off, service discovery. So service discovery can be achieved in multiple ways. Here we'll be using Zookeeper, of course. Um, it's usually used um, uh, to have a service which needs to talk to 
another service which can, which can have multiple instances, and uh, you don't want to have a static configuration telling uh, which service is where. Um, here we don't need to know where all scheduler instances are, but we do need to know how many are there and the um, position of one instance in that list. So each scheduler instance has an instance ID. Um, I recommend UUIDs. It could be anything. UUIDs make it easier and safer. So let's say we have that instance ID. We'll say it's one of the, the schedulers, and we will be acting as if we are that scheduler the entire time. You don't have to memorize the UUID, don't worry. <laughs> um, so first off, all instances of the scheduler when starting will create a Z node. Uh, to tell other instances where they are. So uh, that's how we do it. Uh, this is Scala code, but it could be anything really. Um, so you just specify a path, um, the data. Here we don't have any. Uh, if you wanted to do service discovery where you need to know the IP port, whatever, we, you would put it here. Um, you define also an ACL, I'm not going to talk about it, but you can specify uh, if uh, any client can read it, if only you can read it, if others can edit it, something, something like that. And one special thing, which is called disposition for an unknown reason, and uh, here we're gonna, we'll be creating a Z node, uh, which is ephemeral. So, Zookeeper has persistent Z nodes and ephemeral Z nodes. Ephemeral Z nodes are tied to the session where they were created. So when the session is closed off, for whatever reason, and that's a very important part, um, like it doesn't need to be a clean connection closed. If the application crashes in any way, if the network goes down in any way, after a certain timeout, which you can configure, the ephemeral Z nodes created by a session will be deleted. So in the case of service discovery, it's great because if a um, physical server crashes, you know that it will be down. Other instances will be aware that one uh, crashed. They don't know why, but they know it's not there anymore. So once we uh, register on Zookeeper, what we'll be doing is getting a list of other instances with this very simple piece of code. Um, and we will be doing it with a specific property, which is watch. So what watch does is you will still get the data at the moment you ask, but if later on there's a change, so in that case a new instance uh, or an instance which left, you will get an event. You will only get an event and not the new data. But what that means is, uh, as it's in single operation, when you do a read with watch, you get a piece of data, and you're sure that until the time where you receive an event, that data is the one which is known by everyone, which is the current state of the system. So here we got a list of instances. And so it's uh, uh, sorted alphabetically, and so we know our position is uh, number two, or let's say one if we indexed uh, from zero. So now that we know this, the number of instances and our position in the list, we can take our list of charts, which are very arbitrarily eight charts here, and we can simply apply a modulo of the number of instances on each shard. And so now each shard, as represented here, is affected to one instance. So if I'm instance number one, these are my shards. So you could say that once you know that, it's almost enough, and in some cases it could be enough, uh, because all instances know which shards they are uh, responsible for. Uh, so if all goes well, uh, one shard should be uh, affected to one instance, and one instance should only have a unique list of shards. But it's not over. Things can go wrong and do go wrong. Uh, just an example. Uh, which could happen is if you have an instance ID which is non-unique uh, because uh, you didn't generate it randomly, because there's a configuration which was, which was propagated to multiple instances by mistake, anything can happen. So if that happens, uh, all instances with the same ID will believe they have the first position of that ID 
which will be wrong. So multiple instances will use the same shards, and other shards will be unaffected. And just Murphy's law, anything can happen, really. So what we need here is to be sure that one shard is affected to one instance, and not more, not less. To do that, we need locks. Uh, just a small parenthesis here, because if there are people uh, working in distributed systems, they don't like distributed locks, generally, uh, which is a bit of a unicorn, as uh, Kyle uh, Kingsbury would say. Uh, the way we do it here, and it's not something I invented, it's in the Zookeeper documentation, um, each member of uh, the cluster is part of the algorithm. It's not like just a, a service which tells you, you have a lock, go ahead. That doesn't work, but if every element is uh, part of the algorithm, you can do a distributed lock which actually works. So another part of the keeper which we'll be needing here is sequential Z nodes. Those are Z nodes which are suffixed by uh, an integer, which is generated by Zookeeper. And Zookeeper guarantees that that integer uh, comes from a um, counter which is uh, increasing monotonically. So you know that it's not going backwards, and you know it's that it's unique. Sorry. Um, so that's the, the tree of data we have at that moment. So the three instances and our eight shards. What we'll be doing now is acquiring a lock for each shard which is affected to us. So first step is uh, create um, a slash lock uh, after the shard which we want. We'll, so we'd, we will be doing that for each shard we, we want to acquire lock for. Uh, with the FMAWAL parameter, so if we go down, the lock is released, and sequential, because it's important later. And it's important right now. So that's what we have now, which uh, just one create. Of course, in the real world, uh, all instances will be starting at the same time, and we would have a bunch of locks here, but I'm making things uh, simple here. So once we have that, we know the number that was affected to us, so we can get all the children of that child and know if there are other locks which are acquired by other instances. Well, uh, there was an attempt of acquiring a lock. Right now we know we are the only one here, so we do have the lock. Let's say now that we did not. Uh, if here um, we knew that we had the lock with the number um, 2, for example, and there was a 0 or 1 uh, also. In this case, we do not have the lock, the instance with uh, the other node has the lock. So when that happens, we still believe that we should have it, because our position in the list of instances, so we will keep uh, trying to obtain that lock. So if the other instance goes down, when we fix the issue, or when it actually crashes, or whatever, uh, we do get the lock at, at that point. So what we do is we... Uh, watch the Z node with the previous number. So in that case, we would watch the log 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. Um, and that way, when that node uh, goes away, we know that we can fetch again the list, so back to step 2, and see if we have it. If we don't have it, we watch the next one until we uh, have the, the lowest uh, number. Uh, this is just a trick which is explained in the documentation. Uh, you could think that you could watch the directory, and just act whenever there's a change. But if you have a loss of instances, you would get an event whenever there's a new node created. So even if there are nodes created after you, which you don't care about, or um, even if you have uh, two nodes before you, uh, if the one which is not directly before you uh, goes away, you don't really care. So that would create lots of events and lots of instances querying Zookeeper at the same time, which can take down, uh, well, slow down the system. So that's it, really. You do a loop until you know that you have the lock. And once you have that, um, the life cycle is you, you will keep a watch on the instances list. So whenever there's a change in the instances, you just start the whole process again. So you get the, the list of instances, you get your position in the list, and you try to acquire your uh, new shards with locks. It's three steps, so you drop the locks that you had, you get the instances and you acquire your new locks. And that's it. Uh, 
And of course, you tie your uh, work threads, whatever you're doing, to those locks. So when you drop a lock, you stop working at this moment. Um, so that's it, really. Uh, just a way to make it a bit easier. Because acquiring a lock is like you, you have an algorithm to implement. It's a bit touchy. You can make mistakes. It all happens to, to the best of us. Um, what I discovered after I implemented this is <laughs> Apache Curator. Uh, it's a library which implements all the recipes documented in the Zookeeper documentation. So you've got a bunch of recipes in there. Uh, locks, for one. Uh, leader election, uh, which we use in the orchestration at Clever Cloud. So it's a way to have one instance which is a leader. You're sure that, you're sure that, that instance is a leader. Uh, and whenever it goes down, a new election happens and stuff like that. Uh, you can also do queues in Zookeeper. And anyway, you have lots of things you can do. And they're all implemented in Creator, which uh, simplifies. and. Um, makes your life a bit easier because you're sure that it actually works, tested by multiple people, open source, and everything. Um, so now um, I'm just going to do a little bit of theory. I hope you have enough energy after this long uh, day. Um, just so you know what we are actually depending on on Zookeeper, uh, what allows us to do what we're doing. So first, uh, Zookeeper guarantees sequential consistency. That means that when a client sends data uh, to Zookeeper, so creating a node or updating its data, um, and it sends multiple operations, they will be applied in the order they were sent. They cannot be applied randomly. Uh, the way Zookeeper works and its, uh, its uh, broadcasting algorithm works cannot allow that by design. Another thing is atomicity. Uh, let's say you create a node uh, with data. Uh, your node will not be created without data, or data will not be sent out in the air. Uh, the operation is done at once. Uh, it either completely succeeds or completely fails. Uh, another thing is uh, single system image. That means that uh, wherever a client connects to any uh, server in the cluster, it will see the same thing. Um, modulo the time to propagate, but uh, it's really, really fast. So you can consider that all clients see the same thing. Um, another thing is reliability. Uh, what that means is um, when you write data to Zookeeper, when the client tells you that it's actually written, it is actually written. It cannot go back, it cannot be lost. Um, and that is because a Zookeeper waits for um, a majority of the nodes in the cluster to actually write and uh, acknowledge that it's indeed synced to disk before uh, telling the client that it is indeed uh, written. So it cannot go back. Um, timeliness uh, is a bit particular. Um, what it means is in Zookeeper configuration, you can uh, give it um, a threshold, a timeout. Uh, in which uh, if a delay uh, goes over, like um, a client writes some data, and there's an issue with uh, writing the data to all followers, if it goes over that timing, uh, your client will have an exception, telling it there's a very big issue in the cluster. It won't let you go on like everything is okay. You will be aware that there's a, a problem. Um, whoa. I Went over that one. Oh, no, sorry. My mistake. Um, and so all of this um, is based on a very simple API. I've seen we only used create and read, basically. So what you have in the Zookeeper API is a very basic uh, CRUD API. Uh, so create, delete, read. Uh, yeah. Um, so get create delete, you get exist, we just tell you if a Z node exists or not. Uh, you can get data, you can set data, and you can get children of a node. And that's basically it. Uh, with the um, additions of uh, ephemeral nodes, sequential nodes, we, which are just additional flags. Um, and one more thing is every operation you do on Zookeeper, you can do it asynchronously, which is a default, or synchronously. So you want to wait uh, that the data is indeed synced before uh, going off and doing something else. 
so that's it. So the idea is that it's really a basic API, and you do have to uh, do some work in your applications to make it work. Uh, it's not something magical which gives you which gives you locks and queues out of the box. You have to implement it yourself. Um, but there's Apache Curator, so it's not much work really. Um, just a bit of downsides goes. Sometimes we we just so show the the happy side and everything's all right and and there's unicorns and everything. Uh, so a bit of downsides on Zookeeper. Um, one thing is the um, deployment pro uh, the development process is a bit slow, which is probably one of its um, good points actually because stuff doesn't break. They're very very cautious. But features like TLS support uh, is taking some time to uh, to arrive in the stable branch. Uh, it's been working on sim since 2015, I believe, and it's still in beta branch today. Um, so really, you can only use it in a trusted network. Uh, so at, Zoo at uh, Clever Cloud, we cannot provide a Zookeeper add-on at the moment because that would mean connecting over an insecure connection, and that's just not what we do. Uh, so yeah, a bit of downside. Um, another thing is the documentation in the upside is a bit sparse. So as a, uh, the developer side is quite well documented, actually. Um, it's, uh, the API itself is well documented. The way Zookeeper works and what it guarantees is well documented. It can be a bit of, a, of work to go through and actually process the info, but it's well documented. Uh, to make it run, it's a bit sparse. So you can quite easily run Zookeeper uh, with default parameters. So you can try it on your machine. Really, you just extract the archive and you run it and it just works out of the box. But running a cluster with TLS between the nodes and changing timeouts and stuff like that, uh, it's a bit more complicated. Authentication also is really complicated to, to implement. Uh, so that's it. Are there any questions? In Kafka, uh, what we do here? Well, we do use Kafka afterwards, after the schedulers, but the list of checks, uh, it would be quite hard. Um, we could do it with a compressed topic and have every instance read that topic and share, but they would have to read the topic at the same time. There's no way to actually spread out a compressed topic to multiple uh, consumers, as far as I'm aware. So that's why we're doing it this way. Actually, I, I heard the presentation. Yeah? Uh, a similar problem, but solved in Kafka. And my okay. question was, why not solve it in Zookeeper? <laughs> <laughs> I see. <laughs> yeah, you <laughs> should. Well, yeah, I, actually, when I started working uh, on that problem, at first, I was hoping that I would be able to do this in Kafka, and I didn't find it. So um, what I did here is not the only way to do this, actually. Uh, you could, using Zookeeper, uh, do leader election and implement uh, the spreading out of shards uh, in your code, which also works. Uh, this felt a bit easier and also more fun at the same time, so fun is always good. Um, so yeah, that's it. Uh, is there any other question? OK, uh, so the question is about uh, distributing a Zookeeper cluster in multiple zones, or if we are using only one at the moment. Um, we are only using a Zookeeper cluster in one data center at the moment for that particular usage. Um, for Clever Cloud, we have a Zookeeper cluster spread out on three data centers, uh, but they are very close together. Uh, the documentation doesn't talk about a Zookeeper cluster spread out between uh, America and Europe. Um, given the way it's implemented, I think it would work. Uh, it just would be slower, uh, which is not really an issue. It would be slower, s slower at uh, leader election, so when a node goes down, you would have more downtime than you have when the nodes are closer together. But when the cluster is actually uh, live, I don't think it would be too much of an issue. Actually, uh, when, yeah. Uh, you said that uh, each uh, instance uh, knows uh, the shards, 
Yeah. Uh, you choose it by ETOS model, but yeah. uh, you don't uh, worry about uh, if they're close or not. Oh. So if they're in uh, different data centers, you might uh, choose, uh, you, you might prefer uh, the closer one. Oh, okay. Um, so the question is about why we're using just modulo and uh, spreading out the shards to all instances. Uh, and what would we do if we wanted uh, to um, assign some things to some instances because they are closer together to the data? Uh, in that instance, the data is in a single PostgreSQL database. Um, which, is spread which is just at one point. Um, what I would do in that case, if I wanted schedulers everywhere and I was worried of the latency with the database, which really is not a problem in that case, but let's say, um, with a PostgreSQL database, what I would do is uh, put followers, replicas in other zones where the schedulers are, and then you can spread out the shards everywhere without worrying about it, but each scheduler will uh, just go to the database closer to them and problem solved. Uh, if you wanted to uh, just spread out shards among instances uh, based on their location, you couldn't do it this way, but you could do it with a leader election. Uh, so you just use Zookeeper to elect a leader, and then that one, uh, which has more info, can do uh, this, that sort of thing. Zookeeper is really dumb, actually. Nice timing with a laugh. <laughs> uh, any other question? No? Okay. Um, if you do have more questions and you think about it later, we have a booth. Um, so come talk to us uh, tomorrow. Uh, I should be at the booth all day, approximately. Um, and if you want, you can also send me questions on Twitter. I will be happy to, to reply. That's it. Thank you for, uh, for listening to me.